comfortable do you feel about talking about special forces because that's also another strong character of the work isn't it that you don't talk about what you do well we don't talk specifically about what we do and I think it's really important that people understand particularly the the Australian community understand the sacrifices that their special forces have taken over the years the risks that they take on a day-to-day -day basis when they're on operations and why they do it and they do it because they love their country you know, they love their mates they see that the tasks that they were doing overseas and domestically were really important for our security. And that makes it hard. That makes it hard on people, particularly when they can't overtly go and talk to the media about what they're doing. And we do have very tight operational security. Zero five one, it's Tango four one. We just engaged two enemy in the, uh, in the alleyway. Stand by for fire support. And that in the middle of the night, in the dark of nowhere, if you've done something exquisitely well, you all know it, and that's good enough. That's good enough. I mean, not ex exactly. Because I mean, you know, there are there are things that. Uh, uh, that a number of the guys have done which will never, never be discussed and they'll never receive credit for. But with, internally within the unit, you know, we all know, you know so-and-so you know, had done this, so-and-so, you know, in the heat of the battle had, you know, had done this and he may not have been recognised for it. Mate, we've got contact to our right and contact to our left. Worst, worst time of my life. It was absolutely horrendous, so no positive feedback, getting absolutely smashed all the time. Um, so lots of running of the bayonet assault course, just being, you know, always told, you guys are shit, never gonna make it, what are you doing here? And that, that just wiped a lot of people out, so. Um, I remember one of the staff standing up and saying, you know, if you wanna quit, come forward now and you'll be out of here today. And guys quit um, on our course and then, um, yeah, we got all the way down to 15, so. But for me, I'd train three years for this. I put my life on hold. I had nothing to go back to. I literally burnt every bridge behind me. So for me, there's no point in going home. So James, what is the key to it? What are the right traits? What is special about being in Special Forces? It's <laughs> a good question. I think it's uh, having that ability and that desire to go above and beyond. It's wanting to really have those operational outcomes, you know, work as, work as part of a small team, um, be willing to put aside, you know, the, the physical pain, the, the arduous conditions, uh, and, and still go on and get the job done. You know, you've, and you've got people around you that have the same attitude, so it's, it's a fantastic 
group of people to work with that are all working together and working in the same direction. There we go, they're moving in the green. Yep, that's them, mate. Yeah, range. Range it. 1460. Right, ready, ready, stand by. Bottom. He's taking a few rounds. I think he's still moving. That white guy's taking a good hit. What did you come to see was special about Special Forces? I think there's scope for individuals to bring more of who they are into the work, more so than any other part of the Army. Uh, so it's something that is a real, it's a real strength. It's often difficult to harness exactly how that can be, be utilised. But the scope for individual personality allows for, you know, perhaps more outside the box thinking and more autonomy within the way that jobs are given. So, you know, the work was very end state focus and, you know, the method was or whatever the method is that needs to work to get you there. And, and that autonomy given to the individual, I found to be empowering. Uh, Victor Alpha, we believe one possible KIA. We walked into a fight trap. What was, say, the longest period you were out for? Uh, some of my soldiers were out for, for plus of 40 days. Some of the major operations uh, were 28 to 35 in duration. Uh, we might pause for 24, 48 hours to conduct a uh, refit to fight in theatre, but it is often the case, as a, as a practical example, uh, on day one you would deploy with, a, with your uniform on, which would be your normal um, camouflage uniform. By about day 25 or day 26 in July, August in southern Uruzgan province, you'd take that uniform off and you'd burn it, or it would literally start to um, disintegrate because it's got that much dust and sweat in it that you'd, you'd literally need to destroy those clothes and get more. And, and you think about the conditions and effects that has on fabric and, and what that might mean for the conditions and, and effects it has on the human body. So uh, it was um, probably, I mean, I, it w I, I would be confident in saying it's some of the most arduous physical experiences that our soldiers have been exposed to. And certainly, I'm pleased to say that our people came through it uh, very well. Clear. Clear. So one of the guys drove me down to the flight line, uh, which the US chopper was already turning and burning, ready to fly off. Uh, I was already quite familiar with the crew already, and so they knew I was coming on board. Jumped on the chopper, st strapped in, and we took off. And it took about, I can't remember exactly how long it took me to get out there, but during that time, cold air was rushing in, had the Apache gunship as escort. We're weaving through the valleys of Afghanistan, had my night vision goggles on with a M4, rifle with a silencer with a med pack and I thought hey this is like the highlight of my career nothing could beat this you know this is uh, exactly what I trained up for and what I just yeah everything I dreamt for about when I first joined up in the army. Consider all that gear that you had to carry and time-sensitive targeting, having to move very quickly, having to 
balance that requirement to move quickly with the safety of a route. Just how exhausting was it? Oh, I, I think it's like anything, you get used to your environment. And um, I think that is the, the biggest part of the fitness. It's not so much the fitness to physically do something, but the, the fitness to still be mentally clear, uh, even though you have been carrying that weight. Uh, and I, I think that's probably one of the bigger differences between the fitness levels of special forces to the fitness level of conventional. The ability to still think uh, even though you are fatigued. Peel, peel, keep going. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. Go, 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 go. And still be focused and to have that level of focus on, on what you're doing. There was just a perfect uh, footprint there and it sort of alerted me to the fact that there was someone there and, and they're pretty, um, uh, probably there right right when I was. So that's when uh, I shone my, my torch, my pistol, aimed down towards a small opening and, and called back to the, to the blokes to let them know that there's probably someone in here. And and it was at that stage that uh, I just started getting engaged, uh, probably from about two, two mo more, no more than three metres away. And it was underground, and at that stage, pretty dark and uh, very loud. So it was just a flurry of uh, red flashes coming out of what was just a, a pitch black hole, um, and rounds passing by my head. Uh, passing by my body, um, how they were not hitting me, I, I don't know. And it's just getting covered in rocks and um, uh, shrapnel and stuff like that from, from the rounds that were uh, hitting the walls um, and a few pieces that were embedded in my chest and, um, and a large, large piece embedded in, in my leg. What you got? Mate, I just got a... Uh... <laughs> Gunshot wound hasn't gone through, I don't think. Yeah, Roger. Um, I can't find a massive wound on the other side. There's not much bleed. Yeah, Miss GSW. Uh, right lower leg. Uh, entry only, nil by exit. So, just entry and exit or just entry? Entry only. Pressure bandaging. Signs and symptoms. Heart rate? Heart rate 100. Like Radial pulse palpable. You take that off there for me, brother. Let's go. Let's go. Give it to me. Thank you. We got more. Someone, uh, someone watch our rear. Yeah, we got more dead ground on our rear too. Gotcha. We got two team moving from right to left. Go, covering. There was one guy with a rocket propelled grenade um, and another guy loading it, so the, the, they just kept impacting every every sort of 20 or 30 seconds. Um, and there was one or two guys with machine guns and there was maybe one or one other guy with a standard AK-47 firing at our position. We, we got down behind some rocks and the rounds were coming in all around us. And uh, I thought, I actually thought, this is it, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die in the desert of Afghanistan. I've only been here a couple of weeks, this is no good. Um, I'm not going to get to say goodbye to anyone. I had all these thoughts go through my head very, very quickly, and to be completely honest, I was petrified. I set on an air burst, which means when it gets to a set distance, the, the round will self-detonate. So I set it at around 220 metres, or at their range, and uh, we repeated the process, and on the third time, luckily, um, I got the range right, and uh, I we stood up, I quickly stood up and fired the uh, fired the rocket and uh, it sailed straight over and went right above the top of their compound and just exploded and just dropped all six of the blokes there. So that was a, that was a good result.
So all the Taliban fighting died down because they were now waiting for us. Uh, and there was, a, there was a call to abort. Ignore it. So we're, we're still going. And um, again, we didn't have a compound to land 15 feet away from, but there's no way we wanted to miss the first approach because we were too fast or whatever else and had to come around and give it another crack. That was going to be suicide. Um, so it's the irony and it's the training that you go slower <laughs> and more control to make sure you stick it the first time. And so the 4-6 landed in theirs and then a couple of seconds later we landed in our horseshoe and, uh, and all, all hell erupted all the way around. So there was tracer and heavy machine gun fire going down between the aircraft, across the front of the aircraft, the sides of the aircraft. Um, just absolute mayhem erupted. We didn't see any RPGs flying across the aircraft during the approach. Talking with some of the commandos afterwards, they said, guys, how the hell did you get in there? So what do you mean? Apart from the obvious. Um, and they said, there was RPG went under you, and then another one went over you, as you were on your very final element of approach. And there was no way that should have missed. And we got out of it, not a single scratch. Not a bullet hole, not a scratch. Uh, to, to the aircraft or any of our people, which was just amazing. Yeah. You know, for anyone who hasn't worn them, it's like the, the vision is. The amount you can see is equivalent to having two toilet rolls put up to your eyes, so you can't really see that much except directly in front of you. Talking to my team commander, and I just remember someone saying something uh, in, in Pashtun. It just, it, it was one or two words, turned my head, and maybe about 10 to 15 metres away, uh, a, a dark, shadowy figure had kind of uh, popped around the corner. And just as I caught sight of him, he'd let a burst of AK off, maybe, uh, five or six rounds maybe, um, straight through um, the team. And initially, two or three rounds had, had hit me. I just remember seeing um, sparks kind of fly off my weapon. Um, and I guess the, the blast force kind of hit me in the arm and, and the face. And it knocked me to the ground. And as soon as that kind of happened, I just remember my team commander was, um, he'd been uh, struck too both getting on our guts and, and, and just quickly leopard crawling into, into a doorway which was, uh, you know, three metres away from us. It was really short distance. And then um, immediately turning around and, and, and trying to, uh, I guess, return fire or, or, or see where he'd come from. But he'd already, uh, I guess, disengaged and, and moved off into another position. And, yeah, I just remember thinking, I'd, I'd know, obviously, I'd been shot but I just didn't know how bad it was. You know, so there's any Taliban in the area? Well, the Taliban, but I can't remember this is the day show fake. He was back a few days ago and everything. They would walk around the village and everything, but right now they disappeared. People say that the shot not fired is often more important than the one that, that was fired, but that was also true of the nature of some of the work at this stage. Yes, uh, that's very true. Well, it's funny that our whole honours and awards system sort of has, has been focused on um, how people perform under fire and, and how well you do when you are in a contact. Unfortunately, you've made a mistake to even be in a contact nine times out of ten. I mean, particularly in that time. But uh, for all those patrols that went undetected and, and, and went, out, went about and did their, their job, there was very little recognition for it. And, um, I think it's quite ironic and, and uh, I look back at that and I, I personally um, take pride in the fact that I, I, you know, I led patrols that, that went undetected or went without contact and we, we worked with the locals and we, we, we developed an intelligence that was valuable for, 
for work down the track. It was, uh, as I say, I take pride in that, that me and the blokes were able to do that.